Today I'm going to be planting some herbs and veggies, which seems to be the new craze. Um, people are in their houses now and they're um, cocooning, so to speak, and the kids are restless, so we're going to try to find some things that will keep them busy and they can watch this stuff grow and then they can harvest it. So, and if you don't have kids, you can do the same. So I'm going to start with what we call, what I'm going to call is an annual um, herb mix and it's going to be in a small bowl because annuals only go about six months and then you're replacing them or you start over with something that grows a little bit better in the winter time. The herbs that I chose today are going to be the ones that will grow in the summer or the warm months. I've got cilantro which is a, a wonderful choice for all those Mexican or the Spanish cuisines. Um, we have French tarragon which um, I just was kind of looking it up because I, I don't use French tarragon but I guess it's used in a lot of cooking and it's also rumored to take care of flatulence and um, toothaches which I never knew. So this is a good herb to have around, especially when you're close quarters. We have basil, which used for all kinds of Italian cooking, and my favorite, caprese salad, yum yum, and parsley. Parsley I use in a lot of different things. I use it in my um, marinades, I use it for top dressing on shrimp. It's a, a very versatile herb. So we're gonna start with this small container and um, with containers you want to make sure that you have good drainage. Um, so this one here, check here, I've got a little tab that I can remove and um, pull out and that will give me my drainage, my little drain hole there. And then I'd like to put a little bit of screen material. Um, this is just nothing but fiberglass screening that you use for your windows. Mm -hmm. We do sell um, some little, this is called uh, Keeper Stopper. And it's just a round piece of this. There's five pieces in here. You can cut it up if you want um, and make it stretch a little bit longer. But I'm going to use this piece here, and it's just going to go over my hole to keep the dirt in mm -hmm. and the bugs out. So I'm using a mixture today of Azalea Camellia Mix and my Fox Farms Potting Soil. And I'm going to put these two together. Now the reason I'm doing that is most of your veggies and herbs like to have a little bit more acidic. Acidic is a measurement on the pH scale, 7 being neutral, anything above 7 is alkaline, anything below 7 is acidic. Most of your plants, most of your herbs and veggies like it to be slightly acidic. And because our water and our soil in general, if you're planting in the ground, that being, uh, is, is is alkaline so we it's good to always try to get the pH a little bit lower so I do a little combination of the two because I like the acidic qualities of this soil and I like the drainage and all the other good stuff that's in this soil um, they are both organic and um, they're going to help your plants grow vigorously so I've already got a combination of the two put together so it'll make it a little bit easier, but I do about a 50-50 mix. And I have already got a lot of that already mixed up in this bag here. So I'm just going to put it into the pot. And I'm not going to go all the way up to the top at this point because the plants I'm going to put in here, the root ball is going to take up some space. So I'll do it about three quarters of the way full. And then I'll put my plants in, arrange them. Now when you plant your plants, you want them to be the soil level of your plant. Boy, this guy is stuck in there. He's ready to come out. The soil level of your plant. Oh, he's like, no, I don't want to come out of there. The soil level of your plant. Are you kidding me? There we go. And he is root bound, so we're going to, this will be a good uh, chance to see what to do with the root bound plant. If it's really twisted on the bottom, I'll go ahead and pull some of those roots off. These plants are pretty tough. And then I'll just gently kind of peel them open a little bit like that. Other people cut them 
Um, whatever you do that works for you, and if you've never done it for yourself, what I just did is going to work just fine. So when you plant it, you want the soil level in your pot to be same with the soil level of your root ball. Don't put soil over the top and it's, you don't want it to be too shallow. So and then in my pot, I want to leave myself about an inch and a half to two inches of a lip so that when I water, I can fill it up to the rim, let it drain down, fill it up one more time with water, let it drain back down, fill it up one more time, mm -hmm. three times the charm, and that really saturates your root ball completely and it last takes a little bit longer for it to dry out so you're not out there babysitting it every other day or every day so I'm going to put my shorter plants now it's hard to tell because these plants are all kind of small right now but the basil is going to be the one that's going to grow the tallest so I imagine how big he's going to get he's going to actually get up around this size here Cilantro is usually going to stay down around this area here. Parsley is about the same, and then the ta the oregano, I'm sorry, the tarragon is going to hang off, kind of off to the side. So we're going to treat him kind of like a trailer. So I'm going to arrange my cilantro right in the front here, and I'm going to now this one's a young plant, so I don't need to do anything with the root ball. So I'm going to throw him in the middle. And I want him to be, his root ball to be level with the other root ball. Now I'm still needing some space in here. And then I'm also going to use the parsley. Now with herbs, generally you don't want these guys to go to flower. Once these guys flower, they get kind of rangy and they don't taste as good they their uh, flavor is not as good as when they're not flowering so when I use the fur the fertilizer that I'm going to use with these is only a nitrogen which in your fertilizers there's three numbers there's nitrogen phosphorus and potassium nitrogen is the greening and gr growth phosphorus is roots and flowers and potassium is the overall health of a plant so one way you can remember that is up down all around up for the greening and growth down for the roots and the flowers overall for the health of the, the plant itself so I'm going to go ahead and get these guys planted in here and then we're going to put some fertilizer in around the root balls before we top off the soil to, to bring it back to the right level now these root balls are kind of deep so I need to push them down to the bottom pretty well Okay, now don't worry about, this is going to grow up taller, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, as they um, grow, actually, I'm going to give a little more room here. As they grow, if you start to see them flower, you want to pinch off the flower, and that includes the basil. Now, some people will grow basil to attract bees, and obviously, that's probably not one that you're going to necessarily want to, to eat. You could, but once they start to flower, Again, the flavor is not the same. The leaves are not quite as big because they start putting energy into the flowers. When they're flowering, they're saying, oh, my time is almost done and I better put on flowers so I can have seeds. They're not doing it for us. They're just doing it to survive. So I'm going to put my tarragon in here. Now, when you plant these, also remember that these plants are going to get wider. So this doesn't look like it's very full right now. But as it grows, it's going to fill in this pot. And of course, as you're trimming it and as you're, as you're harvesting it, that'll kind of help it keep all in balance. So these guys right here will be good until the end of summer. Now sometimes cilantro, as it gets hot, and parsley will bolt, they call it, which is nothing more than just flour. And it, there's even if you pinch it off after a while, it just is going to keep flowering. So what you can do is just pull the old one out and put another one in. So midway through the season, you might be replacing the parsley and the cilantro as it bolts. There's not a lot you can do about it. If you, these, all of these plants would like to be more in a morning sun or a late afternoon sun, which is why I kind of put them together. And they all pretty much want the same water level. So now I'm ready for my fertilizer. Now, as you can see here, this particular one that I'm using is 
called Feather Meal. This is put out by a company called um, Down to Earth, and it's organic. They're very picky about where they get their products. Um, we have a full line of their fertilizers. This one is just the nitrogen, which is going to help these guys grow lots of leaves, which is what we want for an herb. And I'm going to grab a handful of this and sprinkle it around the plant. Now this is not because it is nitrogen, it's a slow release nitrogen. So it's not going to just break down right away. And then it will, that way it will give it a um, more of a longer fertilizing than say like bone meal, I mean blood meal, which is right away or even bat guano, they release right away. And you have to be more careful with nitrogen because nitrogen is the one that burns. So I'm just going to mix this in a little bit with the soil. And then I'm going to take the rest of the soil that I mixed up <laughs> earlier and I'm going to fill in the gaps so that my soil level when I'm done will be all the way around the pot about give me about an inch to an inch and a half of a lip there so that when I water because if you put it right up to the edge when you water it's just going to go right over the edge and take your soil with it so I always like to give myself a little bit mm -hmm. of a buffer so to speak so I can water deeper the more the better you cannot overwater anything at one time. It comes with you giving it, you could give this five gallons worth of water as long as it drains. It's when you don't allow it to dry out between those waterings, then you have your problem with overwatering. And most of us, unfortunately, kill things by overwatering because we're killing them with kindness, right? We want to take care of our plants. Okay, so. Let me push this one over a little bit more. So again, as this grows, this is going to fill in this spot. This is going to fill in this spot. This is going to fill in this spot. And this is going to fill in this spot. So now that I am done, now I am inside. So if I were outside, I would take my water hose and I would soak this thoroughly. Now that I've planted it, when Right now, you're going to kind of keep an eye on them. We've been pretty rainy lately, so um, the rain a lot of times will take care of these plants for us until it gets hot. And then, of course, we're going to have some hot days, and it could dry them out pretty quickly. So keep that in mind. If it's cloudy, it's going to go a little longer. If it's hot and dry, it's going to dry out a lot faster. Now, one of the things I like to use, and there's my planted container, and you can see the... the the space I have for the watering. I like to use a moisture meter. And I know a lot of you go, oh no, I don't like the moisture meter. It doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work if you don't use it. Use it every time. When I walk out in my patio, this goes in my pocket. Nothing gets water until it gets a little dipper. And all these things do is you stick them in the soil and it reads wet, dry, or moist. And, um, well, it's wet, moist, or dry, sorry. Uh, most of the plants want to be, there's a, a m number scale here, one through three is dry, four through seven is moist, eight and above is wet. Most of the plants want to be around the four to five, not into the dry, not wet, 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 but heading towards the dry. And I'll put it halfway between the plant and the pot, a couple inches down, and I'll do it in a couple spots. Because sometimes when you water on this side, if you're not filling the whole bowl, maybe you didn't have time and you're in a hurry, you're off to work, hopefully once we all get working, um, you're in a hurry, uh, sometimes you just water one side and this side is wet and these sides are dry. So you put your meter over here and it's like, oh, it's wet, but yet the other rest of the root ball is dry, then you're, these plants are dying and that's why you say this thing doesn't work. So if you use it every time, you saturate well. If you go by what it tells you, you should be fairly successful with not overwatering your plants. Now you can adjust it. 
um, like some plants like to be a little wetter, like blueberries and ferns. They like to be wetter, so you can have it more straight up and down than heading towards the red. And this little guy costs eight bucks. So really, for eight dollars, it's a really good buy. And it gives you a little bit more security, especially for those of you who are just like, have no clue. And you really want to try this. And what discourages most people is the plant dying. So now I've got this, this one done here. So next one I'm gonna do is a perennial herb garden. So I get a little bit bigger pot. Because these guys are gonna hang out in this pot a lot longer. Now because this is a bigger container, I went ahead and had the guys drill me three holes in the pot. And we can do that for you. If you come down here and you wanna buy a pot that doesn't have a hole in it, then we can certainly drill that for you, it's not a problem. So what I'm gonna be putting in here, these are all perennial herbs, meaning they're gonna live year after year after year. Now of course, this container is gonna restrict their growth and once they overgrow, you're gonna to have to probably redo it again. You could probably get about a year to two years out of this arrangement right here, depending upon how much you're harvesting your plants, if you're keeping your plants cut back, they can stay a little bit longer in this smaller container. Now you can also, once they're done, you could always cut them apart and put them in the ground if you needed to do that as well, or just put them in a great big, a bigger pot next size up. So what, we're got, what we've got here is we've got a lavender. This is a heat coat, which is used in culinary um, for the flowers. And um, you put that in your cooking. You can use it as aromatherapy. Um, it's, it's got a lot of great uses and it's going to give you flowers. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to attract butterflies, it's going to attract hummingbirds. Um, I've got rosemary, which is one of my favorite um, things to put in my herb um, uh, uh, cooking. Uh, this one is called Spice Island. I like Spice Island because it has um, a big leaf. It's easier to peel it away, to take it off of the stem when you're cooking with it. Uh, for those of you who've tried to chop rosemary, like me, it like it flings off because it's so stiff. This one is a softer leaf, so it's easier to cut up. So I don't know, just the little things that kind of help um, make it easier to use herbs in the garden. Uh, you can use it dried or you can use it fresh, either way. And it gives that nice like barbecue-y type flavor. Now this one here, this pot here, like I said, I, I drilled it and I put my screen down over the holes and I filled it up three quarters of the way so now we're ready to go ahead and plant these plants. Now I'm going ahead um, pull this guy up out of here and he is a little root bound so again I'm going to gently, no not so gently, <laughs> but I'm going to loosen the root balls here, pull some of that stuff that's t twisted and tightened around the bottom these herbs are pretty hardy, so there's some plants you can't do this with, but herbs are usually pretty easy to do this kind of thing with. And then I'm going to put this down again, giving myself about an inch and a half to two inch um, lip on my pot. I'm going to plant this guy in the center because he's going to be my centerpiece. He's going to grow like this. Then I have sage. This one here is a variegated sage. And it gives like, um, like if you're doing sausage, that's a good one to put it in. Um, sages are my favorite, but I know a lot of you out there like sages. And it's gonna get a flower. It has good fragrance to it. Kinda gives you that woodsy type of feeling. And it's pretty with the variegation on it. And this one is gonna get fairly large as well. So we're gonna put him on the side and he's gonna kinda grow off this way. So then we have, now because these guys, before I get too far along, because these guys are going to flower and grow, no mm -hmm. problem, I can mm -hmm. actually give them a um, complete fertilizer, meaning that I can give them something that has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the one that I'm choosing to use today actually has a, it's like a starter fertilizer where it has extra fungus in the soil to actually promote healthy root growth. These are called mycorrhizae fungus. 
Mycorrhizae fungus were, was discovered when the uh, forestry service was replanting little seedlings. And they were planting them along and they realized some of them were dying and some of them were thriving. And they're like, what the heck? We planted them all the same. They're getting all the same kind of water, etc., etc. How many times have we done that ourselves, right? And some were thriving and some were not. So they did some studies on it and they found that the ones that were thriving had the mycorrhizae fungus. What the mycorrhizae fungus does, and there's many species of it, is it acts as a barrier between the root and the soil and it helps it to help the plant to regulate water, kind of protects them from different things in the soil. Um, it's part of the healthy soil that we're trying to achieve. If you have healthy soil, you have healthy plants. A lot of people just think, oh, as I gotta take care of my plants, I need to fertilize them, blah, 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 and don't care anything about the soil. Well, that's another reason why we like to use organic soils and organic fertilizers, because you have a healthy micro, microorganism uh, grouping in that soil. And what those microorganisms do, their job, is to break up the fertilizers, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassiums, and the soils and the bark products that are in the soils, they break that up and make that available to the plants. Most of these fertilizers, the plants cannot uptake right away. They have to be broken down by something. So for these, I'm gonna put a little bit of this fertilizer in the bottom of the planting hole. About, mm, I'd say about a teaspoon. And I'm gonna put it in the other one as well. And I'm going to mix it up a little bit so it's not just sitting straight on that fertilizer. And then I'm gonna put them back down in their little hole here. So I almost forgot to do that. Okay, so now we've got mm -hmm. some fertilizer in there for these guys. I'm going to mm -hmm. put, now I also Googled what mm -hmm. plants will grow together. This is called companion gardening. So all of these plants, the herbs that I did on the first bowl, these ones here, all the plants that I'm going to be planting today are companion, uh, comp, comp, they go with each other. They like to be with each other. They help each other out. Some plants, if they're planted next to another plant, they fight each other. So, you know, we want to give them the best chance they can get. This is marjoram. I use marjoram kind of like um, oregano. Uh, it's good in your salsa, sauces. It's good for marinades. And it's sweet. It has a little bit of sweet flavor to it. And it smells so good. Mmm, smells so good. Okay, this one here, let's see, I need to get my mapping here because these two plants are gonna get pretty big. These two plants are going to be more, this one's gonna trail, this is oregano, and I like the Italian oregano myself, but usually what I tell people is taste it, smell it, give it a little taste while you're in the nursery. We're not gonna get, we're not gonna jump on you because you're taking a leaf and tasting it. I like to taste them to see if that's the flavor I'm looking for. Um, each person has different flavors, so or different taste buds. So one person may like this one, one person may like uh, the, the hot and spicy. Um, I prefer the Italian, and then also there's a yellow variegated one that I really like to use, or a golden oregano, and that one works well too. Mm -hmm. Again, these are gonna just keep going and going throughout the season. The more you pinch them, these ones, the oregano and the marjoram, you really don't wanna let them flower because again, they don't do as well. So if you're constantly cutting off the new growth and getting rid of those flowers, it's gonna keep putting on those nice fragrant leaves for you. So I'm gonna plant this guy down in here. Let me get some fertilizer for him. Also, something that you can use with your herbs and veggies is Epsom salts. Now I'm gonna put the Epsom salts a little bit more towards the top. We carry the Epsom salts here, but you can, you can use the Epsom salts that uh, you get from the grocery store as long as there's not funky stuff in them. You don't need them you know, with menthol in them for your feet or, or any fragrances, just the straight old Epsom salts our grandmothers used. And I'm just gonna put a little pinch, let me finish planting these and I'll put that later. Um, again, this one's not too bad for root ball, so we can, we can put him right in here, not a problem. And now I'm gonna do my oregano now. So we've got these fertilized with this kind of starter fertilizer. After about, on your um, 
your other herb, the herbs I did earlier, these fertilizers last about six to eight weeks. So if you're doing a liquid fertilizer, something that you add to water and water in, those go away in about two weeks. So you're having to do the liquid fertilizers a lot more often. They go to work faster, but you have to do it more often. If you're like me, you're lucky to get out in your garden just long enough to harvest this stuff and then cook and go eat and hang out with your family. Um, but it's, it's much easier for me to do an or, a, a granule, then I don't have to be babysitting the plants as much. But if you're like trying to jumpstart something, let's say this one here is coming off of the winter and you're wanting to give it a oomph, you can use the liquid fertilizer. I like um, seaweed extract is a good one. The fish, fish meal or the fish, uh, liquid fish food, it, it's kind of stinky, but it works and it goes to work quickly. Again, if you're wanting to keep it organic, if you don't care about organics, you can use any of the other liquids or uh, powders you add to water to make it liquid. This one is a heat coat um, lavender. I looked it up. Heat coat is one of the ones they use in culinary. Uh, we do have other varieties, but those are more for just smelling, sachets, things like this. This one can actually be used for all of those. Sachets, uh, aromatherapies, uh, cooking, uh, f uh, the flowers go into all different, um, I was at the ice cream shop, of course, I don't know if they're still open anymore, but they were, they got lavender infused ice cream. It tastes, it tastes good. I'm, I, I'm surprised. It was like, ooh, really? But it works. So now I need to add some soil to finish off the top. Now, before I do that, I'm going to put a little bit of the Epsom salts in around the root balls, just like you're salting and peppering your soils or your meals, um, just a little pinch around the edge there. And what Epsom salt does, it's magnesium. So it helps with the cell wall of the plant. It, it makes it stronger, makes the leaves more firm. Um, like for roses, in fact, if you're using it for roses, you can, um, let me get some soil here. You can, give it to roses and it causes the flowers to be more, the stems to be stiffer. So if you got a heavy flower and it's constantly like sad all the time, if you give it Epsom salts, that'll make it pop back up. So Epsom salts is a good thing to use in the garden. Just don't overuse it because it is a salt. So if you put it just like anything, if you put too much salt on, even for us, if we put too much salt, it's not good. So you want to do it uh, responsibly. Okay, so what I'm doing on here in my little bags, I'm just taking a handful of the azalea mix and I'm popping it into the potting soil bag and I'm kind of mixing the two up together and that's giving me my backfill that I'm going to finish off with this container right here. And again, once I'm done here, I'll take it outside and I'll give it a good watering, nice deep soaking. These herbs want full sun. That means full sun is, is five hours or more of direct sun. Now it could be in the morning, three hours, and then in the afternoon, two hours. Um, it could be all in the morning. It could be all in the afternoon. Just five hours of sunlight directly hitting it. Uh, nothing between it. No covers or shade covers or anything like that. Also, when you're planting your plants in containers like this, you want to make sure that they're compatible with the watering. All of these plants want to dry out between waterings. Most plants want to dry out between waterings. There's just a few, like ferns, azaleas, blueberries like to be wet. You know, you think about if you do research about where they come from, if they come from a place where it's wet all the time, that's a good chance that they're going to want water. If they come from places that are arid, then again, that's a good chance they're going to want to dry out between waterings. If they come from a place that's really cold and has good drainage, guess what? They're not really going to grow well here. So that's another thing, too, is we try to, in our nursery, bring in plants that are going to do well. We want you to be successful, mm -hmm. therefore that makes us successful. Okay, so now we're done. 
Now, this is going to grow up in the middle here. This has got to fill this little section here. This is going to grow out over the edge. This is going to fill this section here. And this is going to grow out over the edge on this side. So it's a nice, and it smells. I wish you could smell this. It smells so good. I've got all this aromatic mm -hmm. herbs right here. Just rubbing your fingers through them, that'll give you a smile for sure. Okay, next we're going to do tomatoes. Yeah. Okay. Now, with tomatoes, we got the big pot because we need room for the tomato to grow. So I googled again companion plants that go with tomatoes. So I came up with borage, marigolds, thyme, and I got two different thymes. So we got all the time in the world, right? Because we're at home. And chives. So I'm gonna start off with the tomato in the middle because after all, he is the star of our show. Uh, this particular one is um, black crim, so he's going to have a black, blackish green, uh, blackish red hue to him when he's ripe. He's one of my favorite ones. Now I chose this one because he's kind of overgrown in this small little pot, and that's okay with tomatoes because what you can do with tomatoes mm -hmm. is you can pinch off these bottom leaves. I'm going to cut them off because they're pretty big. Pinch off these bottom leaves up the stem. And we're going to bury this guy deep. And this is one of the few plants you can do this with. This and cabbage, you can do it with cabbage and kale. You can bury them deep as well. But tomatoes actually thrive when you do this because all the stem right here is going to turn into roots. And the more roots you have, the better it was going to perform in the long run. Now with tomatoes, they need calcium. For those of you who've grown tomatoes and you get this brown spot on the bottom, a big brown uh, rotten area on the bottom of your tomato, that's because it didn't have enough calcium. We call that blossom end rot. And the, the solution to that is calcium. Now one way of doing that, I've heard people, milk, whatever, but ew, yuck. It'll work, but yuck. Um, <laughs> I like to put bone meal. Now bone meal is nothing but bones. So bones are nothing but calcium. So bone meal works well and it doesn't break down so quickly. So what I'm using here is a product called fish bone meal. And this comes from fish. Kind of stinky, a little stinky. But once you get it in the ground, it's not bad. I have had in the past, raccoons or some kind of something get into my plants because they smelt the fish bone. So hopefully you're not going to have that problem. But I like this one because it has does have a little bit of nitrogen in it. Um, as you can see, the first number is three, so it's not very much. Just to give it a little encouragement to grow. But your middle number is 16, so that's pretty high. So that one is telling me that it's going to give me roots and flowers, which is what I want, plus the calcium that the tomato needs. Now, if you've already planted your tomato and you didn't put bone meal in there, you can certainly do a top dress or put it around the top. Or you, I do sell a product called um, uh, uh, Rot Stop, and that is a calcium, liquid calcium you spray onto the plant. And it works very well. Okay, so this one's not too root bound considering how big the top of it is. So I'm gonna loosen it up a little bit. And I've had to dig this deep because I, I have to bury this whole thing. But I want you to see that this is okay to do. So let's say you're at the nursery and they're running low on stock and you got this crazy looking overgrown four inch plant. If it's a tomato, no sweat. Actually, this guy is a little more mature than the other one, so it's okay to have one that's a little overgrown because we can fix that. We can bury it, and he's going to be just fine. Okay, whoops, forgot to put the bone meal in there. I, I go preaching my, my, my uh, sermon here and then forget to do what I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's okay. No big deal. Nobody's perfect. Okay, so 
I can give this one because there's not a lot of nitrogen in it. I can give it a handful. And that's what I do. I give it a handful. Poof, poof. And I'm going to mix it in there. And I might give it just a little bit more, just for good measure. Again, double it is not mm -hmm. good, but a healthy amount of bone meal in the hole is a good thing. Now, again, because my other, not, my other fertilizer, my starter fertilizer, this one here, BioLive, this one doesn't have a lot of nitrogen in it, so it's not going to be that a big of a problem for me to put both of them in here at the same time. And again, it's just a little handful, about uh, two tablespoons. And then I'm going to mix that in there too as well. Now, now we're going to bury him in here. Get him down where he needs to be. And there we go. Okay. So now I googled and found all of these plants would be great companions for the tomato. Okay, get him in there. So, let's do, this one is borage, and I hope you can see this little pretty blue flower up here. He is so pretty. Borage, you can actually eat this flower. You can, it's sweet. You can put it in salads. You can put it on desserts. That's the first time I saw it. It was in Argentina, and they had it on their desserts. And I'm like, whoa, what is that? Borage. Hey, that's cool. You can eat the leaves, but they're very spiny and they're tough. So normally they recommend you cook them like greens. Um, but it's mainly sold for the flour, and it has a, another property for tomatoes. It actually will keep that big old fat ugly green hornworm away. It, it deters them. Now it doesn't, doesn't mean that you wouldn't get one or two of them on there, but it is one that's going to help to keep them from going crazy on your plant. And it does reseed itself. So you can get these popping up in your garden. If it's a problem for you, just rip them up out of the ground. They're, they're not like dandelions where you pull them up and, and they break off and they come back again and again. It's pretty easy to get rid of if you don't really want it. But it's so pretty. And hummingbirds like it. Um, butterflies like it. Um, just not the hornworm moth. He doesn't like it. So we're going to plant this. And he's going to get, he's kind of going to grow like... Hmm, an artichoke in a way it's going to get about oh uh, about a foot tall and kind of spread out a little bit so he's going to grow off this way the tomato is going to take up it's it's going to be big tomatoes get big um i only have a small tomato cage oops forgot to put the fertilizer small tomato cage because we're out of the big ones um and you'll see that it's it will work, but if you have a bigger tomato cage, I would use a bigger tomato cage. All right, the other thing I'm going to put on the other side, which is also pretty, this is a marigold. And I'm sure a lot of you have probably read that marigolds will help to keep insects away. Um, mm -hmm. and sometimes it works for me, sometimes it doesn't. I still get some bugs on there, but it's pretty. And if it'll do a little bit of good, why not? Put it in there. Okay, so a little bit of our fertilizer again. On the hole. And we're also going to put some of that Epsom salts when we're done before we fill everything in. Again, use a little root balm. So, here we go. And then that's going to fill in this spot here. I have thyme all the time in the world I have two kinds this one is a golden lemon thyme and this one is just regular lemon thyme there are different times <laughs> that sounds funny there are different times that you can get again I suggest you give them a pinch and a taste um, I like the lemon and the lime they're my favorite um, but there's all like I said there's all different kinds and each person has a different flavor so different taste buds 
So we're gonna put, and I like this one too because it's gonna add some nice color. It'll give a little contrast to the, to the blue of the, the borage and the yellow and then the orange. So, you know, we got some color going on here. All right, so this one, I'm gonna get it sideways so I can reach it. And again, we're gonna put a little bit of the fertilizer. And the thyme is going to trail over the edge. And when I use thyme, I will take the different sprigs. Sometimes I put them in soup. I'll just put the whole sprig in there and not take the leaves off of the stems. Generally, I take the leaves off of the stems because I don't like to chew on a stem. Um, when you're cooking, sometimes it, it doesn't break down and then you get this like stem in your mouth, which to me is not fun. So I like to take the leaves off of the stems. It can be a little time consuming, but the reward to me is worth it. So it doesn't bother me to do that. Okay, now on the other side here, we're going to put the other thyme and chives. Chives will also go with your tomato. All of these, like I said, are companion plants. So they will all complement each other, which makes a big difference. I, I planted a garden for a gal many years ago and I did all companion planting. I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Google it. I'm gonna put everything that does well with each other next to each other and see what happens. Oh my gosh, it was a huge difference. And then I'm thinking, well, no wonder, no wonder half the time some of my stuff doesn't, didn't work because I was putting enemies with each other. So it does make a difference. And it's very simple, just Google companion planting. And I know you guys got time to do that out there, right? We get a lot of people searching the internet for all these crazy plants now. And um, again, you know, be patient with us because we're having a hard time making minimums. We are, there are some nurseries still open out there, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we're getting good supplies of herbs and veggies now still, so that's good. And we're, we've been able to get some citrus, pretty good steady supply of citrus right now. So that's good. We've got lots of deciduous fruit trees right now. Um, lots of citrus right now. Um, now some of the varieties are not, you know, we have a lot of lemons. We've got lots of lemons right now. We have some good oranges and some tangerines right now. So, and it varies each week. But so far, so good. All right, so now I've got those two in there, and I'm going to be a little more liberal with the Epsom salts on the tomato because we want him to be strong and be able to support all those nice big tomatoes we're going to have on it as soon as it gets going. Now, the tomato is going to take probably about 70 to 90 days for it to start going. Now this one here's already got flowers on it and it'll probably set some flowers and some, some fruit here pretty soon. Because they're bigger it takes a little bit longer. The smaller ones like Sun Gold is a good one. Um, the cherries are good. They don't take as long because they don't need to be as big to get ripe. So, okay, so now I have that and I will come back and top it off with some soil. And then to finish this off, I'm gonna throw a tomato cage in there. Again, I would have liked it to be a little bit bigger, but it is what it is. Now these, they come like a cone, but you actually bend the, 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 the branch legs out, so they'll go straight down into the ground. And then we're going to put him, put it around here. Now if you do, you have, you should do this when you plant, because if you try to do this after the plant is growing, it's a disaster. <laughs> Believe me, I know, I've done it. So we're gonna get this down in here. Now as the plant grows, we're going to encourage it to go up through the center of the cage. There we go. So this plant will grow up into the center and it will um, 
support the plant from falling all over the place. And you want to try to keep your veggies off the ground as much as possible. And I'm going to go ahead and fill, put some more soil in here because I want to top dress it with another product that I like to put on top. And top dressing, top dressing is when you just put something on the top and let it kind of settle in that way. And let me put this over here so you can see me as I'm doing this. Now two, I do have saucers available for to go underneath the plants. Usually, unless you've got something that might be damaged, I wouldn't necessarily put a saucer on it until it gets hotter. The saucer will actually help to keep it a little bit moist longer. So the product that I'm going to put on here now, after I get a little more soil in here, is called Malibu Compost. And what, what Malibu Compost does, it's a highly compost, composted dairy cow manure. It is so composted that you it doesn't stink. I mean, it's we uh, you can do a compost tea with it. We do sell a compost tea here, all ready to go. You just have to put it in a bucket of water and, and let it soak uh, overnight, and you can use it that way. But this one here is, uh, like I said, they, it where we get it from. It, the guy is very picky about his sources. They're all. Uh, dairy cow and they're organic so they're not giving them hormones and all this other junk so the manure is very good quality and it's trustworthy I could trust where it's coming from and how it was harvested he's very 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 picky about where he gets his product same with down to earth which is why I like to use both of those guys and I've always had really good results with their products. So now we're going to take this and we're going to scatter it along the top. We had, um, I was talking about the compost tea. We were, we were brewing the compost tea here as um, um, the vendor, who, or the owner of the company basically, was doing a little demo with this and he dared one of the guys to drink the compost tea. Well, we have some crazy guys here and they did, he drank it. And he turned green and, no, just kidding, he did not. <laughs> he, he, it was like, he was fine with it. It didn't have a bad flavor, it didn't smell bad. And for him to even consider it, that tells you that it's not stinky and that we're not afraid to use it. So, and every person that we've recommended this for comes back for more. So now you can use it on anything. It doesn't have to be veggies. I top dress this in all my potted plants outside, whether it's flowers or veggies. Um, every spring, I'll give it a shot. And then in the fall, I'll do it again. And you can do it in your flower beds. You can do it around your tree, your fruit trees. It's awesome for fruit trees. It's just, what it does is it jump starts those microorganisms, the ones I was talking about, that breaks up the fertilizers, it breaks up the different bark products that are in the soil. Oh, this smells good too. Yum. Okay, so we've got chives, marigolds, thyme, forage, and even more thyme. Yay! Okay, so now we're gonna do some peppers. And I can't get out of it. <laughs> Let me get this pot out of the way. <sighs> oh, that's heavy. <sighs> okay, now, in this one, we're actually going to plant some seeds. So this way you guys can see what it's like or how you need to plant seeds. So I'm going to put three different types of peppers in this plant, in this pot. I have a habanero, for those of you who like it hot. I have a jalapeno, 
which is your normal, you know, run of the mill, mild, but yet spicy. And then I have a bell pepper, red bell. Now, I have planted these together before. And I will say that your bell pepper will pick up a little bit of heat, just a hint. And it's funny because you give, give it to your friends and they're eating it and they're going, is there a little bit of heat in there? It's like, yeah, there is. It's kind of fun. Um, if you don't want any heat to any of your peppers, then um, just plant all bells or all sweets. Um, it doesn't really matter. This pot is big enough to take on three of those peppers and not be a problem. Now I've had habaneros get pretty good size and I have a chocolate habanero from last year and it wintered over. So did my bell. So a lot of times you can get these guys to go another season and they're just now starting to wake up. They're not too happy with all this rain for now, mm -hmm. but I'm sure, well, you can see they are enjoying the rain for sure. Okay, so we're going to put, mm -hmm. again, um, I filled it up and I'm going to do all the same things for this pepper basically that I did mm -hmm. for the tomato. Um, they too can get a, a blossom end rot kind of thing where they're not as happy so I'm going to put some bone meal in here as well and let's see where's my bone meal mm. there's my bone meal I'm going to do the same thing with this I'm going to put a little bit about I would say two tablespoons they don't need quite as much as the tomato because the tomato really needs that calcium Squash is another one that needs to have that calcium. Plus the bone meal is going to promote flowers. Now on these vegetables, we want flowers because the flowers turn into the fruit. So we want to encourage the flowers. So it's always good to put a little bone meal in there. And I'm gonna put some Epsom salt in there as well. And then we're going to plant some seeds in between. I've got carrots and this is an heirloom carrot, which is purple with a orange center. They're very pretty. Um, this one is a, a combo of scallions, which are just, I mean, uh, yeah, scallions. They're like your um, green onions. And then I have some beets that we're going to plant. And that doesn't look good. Okay. So now we're going to put in our peppers. This one is a jalapeno. Got to make sure I leave the label on these guys so I know what I got. Okay, jalapeno. This one's got a smaller root ball so I'm going to build up the soil a little bit so he's up higher. Got my habanero here. And habaneros are pretty hot. They're not the they're not the uh, cobra back black cobras or the scorpions Trinidad scorpions or the ghost peppers. I'm not into those really really hot ones. I, honestly, I don't see how people can eat them, but they do. Um, to each his own. And to me, habaneros got a, a a good flavor as well as the heat, and it doesn't linger. I mean, it's not like burning you for hours later. And this is my bill. Okay. Now I'm kind of putting them towards the center and they'll grow out. And I'm also going to put a tomato cage on these guys because with the habanero, it can get pretty good size. And I want to keep them, especially with the bell pepper, when it gets fruit on it, it's going to start leaning over. And I want to just keep them all together as much as possible. Okay, so now I'm going to plant, I'm going to fill it up with some soil and then we're going to top dress with the Malibu compost and I'm actually going to put those seeds directly into the Malibu compost. I've started seeds with the Malibu compost straight, not a problem. Now you wouldn't do that with, with regular steer manure or 
horse manure or anything like that. This, like I said, Malibu is a highly composted manure, so it's not hot, meaning it's not going to burn your plant or cause salt burn with your plant like other manures can do, um, which is another reason why I like to use it. Now the bell peppers are all the peppers again are our full sun plant so again like we were saying before five hours of direct sun is uh, what they're going to want i have had pretty good results with them not getting the hot sun uh morning sun uh, i have mine in, a, in kind of the halfway underneath the shade cover and it uh, gets morning sun till about noon and then it gets filtered sun the rest of the time and that seems to be doing pretty good. Uh, it seemed like when it was really, really hot, the peppers were struggling just a little bit. So I kind of like to put them in that uh, more of a filtered sun, not quite so hot sun, but tomatoes, they like the heat. They like it hot. Isn't that funny? These guys are hot and they don't like it so hot. That's funny. Okay, so now I'm about a quarter of an inch to maybe a half an inch of where I need to be on my top. I'm going to grab the Malibu again. And I'm going to top dress. Now seeds, they have planting depths. So you on the package it will tell you how deep to plant your seeds. If you plant your seeds too deep, they will not come up. There's a reason why they have the depths on them. If you, uh, for seeds, if you let them dry out too much while they're trying to germinate, they won't work. So you'll have to keep this guy a little bit more on the moist side until you start seeing the little seedlings coming up. Once you see the little seedlings popping through, then you can start cutting back on the water. Most of these will take seven to 14 days to germinate the seeds, meaning to uh, start to grow. And, okay, there we go. All right, so now I'm gonna take my beets and the planting depth is a half an inch. So I'm gonna make like little, little quadrants here. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do beets here I'm going to do my onions here, and I'm going to do my carrots on the side. I'm going to kind of make a little rows here. Now, they tell you to plant a little more than what you think you're going to use, or what you need, because you're going to thin them. Now, that's, for me, the hard part. I have a hard time thinning, thinning my seedlings, but you need to do that. Now, a beet is going to get this big, so if you put seeds all next to each other, it doesn't give them any room to grow. So you will have to thin them. But the cool thing about it is, is you can eat those beet greens. So you can have little baby beet greens in your salads or mix them in a stir fry. So it's not like you're really wasting it. Um, and you don't want to pull them, you want to pinch them. If you pull them, the ones that are left behind, their roots are going to be tangled in with each other and that could damage the other ones. So you want to pinch them. That's what they call pinching. Okay, so now I'm going to take a pencil or a pen and I'm going to